Hi, welcome along to another video. All the links to the articles be in the info section. We're going to start with the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, PNAS. Solar geoengineering may lead to excessive cooling and high strategic uncertainty. It's from June the 1st, over at physics.org. The human factor limits hope of climate fixes. It's from the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, June the 1st. Engineering the climate can help lower temperatures and reduce climate change impacts. New research shows that when accounting for human behaviour, climate engineering leads to significant economic and social risks. In a first of its kind laboratory experiment, and we'll just stop it there because it is an experiment. It's to do with people and just what their ideas are about it, which we find out from the actual report that they're referencing. We study the governance of solar geoengineering using a laboratory experiment in which participants engage in a public good or bad game. Results confirm that too much geoengineering can occur, leading to considerable economic losses and increased inequality. The experiment also highlights unforeseen governance risks associated with such technologies. So there's not actually a lab experiment going on there. A bit of market research by the sounds of it over to infrastructure intelligence from the 3rd of June how quickly can net zero really happen the article is about getting to uh, zero carbon greenhouse gas removal and solar radiation management are the two principal components of geoengineering that will be needed to manage our climate and thwart the worst effects of the global warming the world needs to do a huge amount of research initially and later execute mega engineering projects at such scale to realize these vast goals and to safely ease our climate back to one that life on earth can safely live within. Tim Chapman is the director at Arab and a member of the Environmental Industries Commission Net Zero Task Force. Now the thing is, what Tim is saying is that solar radiation management needs to be done to safely ease our climate back to one that life on Earth can safely live within. And as you know, solar radiation management would mean creating a cloud-covered sky which stops the things in Tim's photograph from working. Solar panels. Because as shown in the photograph, you need a blue sky and sunshine and that's why they're called photophelvic. The key there is photo, like photosynthesis. It needs sunlight. The efficiency of solar systems is extremely reduced over under a cloudy sky. So I'm going to do weather, weather modification, climate modification, geoengineering, SRM, cover the sky in cloud so no sunlight can get through. And that's going to enable us to go to net zero because we're going to be using solar panels that don't work. Yeah, OK. That makes sense, Tim. So moving over to the resources website, innovative ideas and engaging stories in environmental economics. Money, in other words, environmental money. Adding subtraction to the climate toolkit, discussing carbon dioxide removal with Will Burns. This is from the 2nd of June. It's a podcast, you can listen to it, you can read the full interview in text on the website, link provided of course. So in this episode, host Daniel Ramey talks with Will Burns, co-director of the Institute for Carbon Removal, Law and Policy at American University and an expert on geoengineering strategies. Uh, we're, we're all one of them, aren't we? <laughs> Shut up, Peter. So the interviewer says we're going to talk today about carbon dioxide removal, sometimes referred to as CDR. Will Burns, yeah, I was very interested in animals when I was young. And the article goes on a bit about how they're concerned about wildlife and animals and forests and things like that. So it's good that they're concerned about animals. Always good to know there's another two vegans out there. So the article goes on to talk about ideas of carbon capture. One of the other ideas in the ocean is called ocean, ocean alkalinity enhancement. This is to increase alkalinity in the ocean. You all know that as ocean fertilization. So it does go on about enhanced mineral weathering, which isn't to do with weather modification. And then they do actually state ocean fertilization. There's been some field experiments in terms of ocean iron fertilization. The other two primarily remain largely in the lab. 
So why am I going over this? It's just in there's a couple of articles today that we're just going to look at a bit in depth about what the people are actually saying, suggesting. So the interviewer of the podcast, let's move on to the last substantive question I want to ask you about carbon dioxide removal, which is about governance. We had an episode a few weeks ago where we talked about solar geoengineering with David Keith. There's some overlap between this topic and that one. The interviewer is definitely on, on the subject. We've interviewed David Keith from Harvard. You'll all know that name. So this is where the fun starts for a bit. Another approach that's being discussed is something called bioenergy with ca- carbon capture and storage. The idea here is to use bioenergy feedstocks to produce energy, things like trees or crops or crop residues, and then we, we burn those feedstocks to produce heat or electricity, or we use them to produce biofuels. We then capture the carbon dioxide from the flue stack and we can pressurise it into a liquid and then ship it for storage in either terrestrial areas, such as saline aquifers, or in the world's oceans. So, just to pick out the main bits of that, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Use bioenergy feedstocks to produce energy, things like trees. We burn those feedstocks to produce heat or electricity. So just to narrow that down a bit more, we just take the things like trees. So carbon capture and storage, they kind of sound familiar. I remember I think trees do that. This is the person being interviewed. One of the things being developed in the last couple of years is something called the Trillion Trees Initiative. And even President Trump who is normally pretty hostile to climate initiatives, endorsed this Trillion Trees initiative at the latest Davos summit. So basically then, how that's going to work, it's, um, I've got my kid to do these drawings. There's your trees. So basically what's going to happen is, you know, trees take in CO2, right? And they give out oxygen, don't they? That's what we know trees do. They take in CO2, give out oxygen. So what these people are suggesting is, because they want to, they're going to be burning trees, right? So it's trees that take in CO2 they're not going to be putting out oxygen anymore because they're going to be burnt in a furnace and you can see um, on the power station there it's got a little carbon capture device on the chimney right so the trees taking in CO2 they're not going to be putting out oxygen they're going to be put into the furnace to burn to create power and that's what they're suggesting which is very very interesting but I'm and anyone I guess you can only presume from that that the power is going to be used to power the oxygen generators to put the oxygen back out into the air. That's how that works, right? Or maybe I've misunderstood something there. I don't know. They don't mention oxygen generators or what's being done with the power, but you'd have to presume that if you're going to use the trees that capture carbon as biofuel to create power, well, then they're not going to be producing oxygen. They're going to be producing power. So you're probably better off using some of that power or all that power to create oxygen, aren't you? Because otherwise you're going to die. Oh my God, we're all going to die. There's a lot of that going on, isn't there? So, moving on. At physics.org, there's a Philippine volcanic eruption could prompt El Nino warming next winter. It's from June the 4th. This is an article about researchers whose next step will be to use the eruption to better assess impacts from stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, also known as solar radiation management, a theoretical method of reducing global warming by injecting sulphate aerosols into the stratosphere via balloons that would work as a sort of deliberate volcanic eruption. As you know from previous episodes and maybe your own research when they mention SRM via balloons, they're talking about the stratospheric particle injection for climate engineering, also known as the SPICE project. SPICE, you can see in the image there, volcano. If we skip over to Fox News, March uh, March 22nd, 2013, megavolcanoes responsible for mass extinctions on Earth. So the idea is to mimic volcano eruptions to protect us from climate change. And for example, the release of gases from giant eruptions caused climate change that led to the end Triassic extinction. The widespread loss of land and sea sea species made way for the rise of the dinosaurs. So mimicking volcanoes probably isn't a good thing. The Toba eruption. This event caused a global volcanic winter of six to ten years and possibly a thousand year long cooling episode. I don't know why anyone would want to mimic that. Okay, might not be that extreme, but these things aren't controllable, are they? Over at ResearchGate, there's a research paper from the Advances in Atmospheric Sciences, Advances in Cloud Physics and Weather Modification in China. 
the Ward County weather modification vote. Obviously, we still have absolutely no idea what's going on there because we're banned from looking in the UK because we do not belong to the EU, which is restricted from looking at USA News. So there's some links to the four or five ones in the info section, but essentially they're from the Mind Daily News. Kelly Anderson's claim in, in the May 23rd, 2020 edition of the Mind Daily News concerning the secrecy around who decides when and where cloud seeding. <sighs> Exciting. Ward County voters to decide future of weather modification. Measure brings out differing views on cloud seeding. Local news, May 30th, 2020. Real world data shows hail loss rates have not changed since the years before 50 years of cloud seeding. They also claim Canadian insurance, something else. A postcard mailed by the North Dakota Weather Modification Association to Ward County voters in May has opponents of the county's cloud seeding fuming, probably. I'm not allowed to add things in, am I? But let's say fuming. WSF Public Media. We had fewer hurricanes in the 70s and 80s, which researchers say that slow phase won't likely return. This is from June 2nd, 2020. Over the last 150 years, as the oceans gradually warmed, seasons shifted between active and less active phases on 60 to 80 year cycles. We've been in what's called the warm phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation since 1995. Increasingly, researchers think the pattern is no pattern at all, but a result of soot in the atmosphere blocking the sun. So there are people arguing that one thing to do in the short term is to basically mimic what vulc volcanic eruptions do. But the geoengineering solutions still need research. Spreading aerosols to stop warming completely could worsen droughts or hurricanes, but if aerosols were used to reduce just half the warming, Climate hazards could be significantly reduced around the planet, while worsening conditions in a fraction of areas. Researchers from Harvard University and University College London said in a March study. As you know, Harvard is where David Keith works out of, and Harvard University is one of the biggest promoters of weather modification, climate modification technologies, along with MIT. In the Herald Writer, Amazing West Africa, along with an eco-friendly network it's from the 1st of June. This article is about hydroelectric power and a brand new hydroelectric power plant in the Ivory Coast. So scientists were looking at different scenarios. These feature a standard scenario of merely growing sustainable implementation to match hydro's capability to support it up. One where the impacts of weather modification on rain were, were actually thought about. The really good headline is actually that, at the very least for the prompt future, weather modification does not present concerns for hydro-focused planning similar to this. And weather modification and hydroelectric power should be very concerning for these people because it goes wrong. As mentioned before in previous news articles, Tasmania Snowy Hydro, a hydroelectric power company based in Queensland, Australia and Tasmania, carry out weather modifications over the mountains in Queensland and also in Ta Tasmania. They were responsible for the death of Mary Alford, a pensioner who couldn't escape the floods, and that was in June 2016. So West Africa, hydroelectric power is good, but watch out for the weather modification that goes with it. Hey, it kills people. And you can see here, Hydro Tasmania asked to explain cloud seeding and catchment day before flooding. For hydropower to work, you need water. Over to the SciTech Daily, June 6th, reflecting sunlight to cool the planet. And this is by MIT. So this isn't an article in the SciTech Daily where an independent person or journalist or whatever looks at um, MIT investigating solar geoengineering proposals. No, this is MIT talking to you about MIT investigating solar geoengineering proposals. So this isn't an independent article as such. This is um, a promotion article. They write in the article about their own work, so it's self-promotion. It's not a critical journalistic article, is it? Solar geoengineering proposals will weaken extratropical storm tracks in both hemispheres, scientists find. There's plenty to read in that article. And then also in the SciTech Daily, and going completely off topic as such, obviously there is an element of the red blood cell thing within the days gone by of people saying on heavy spray days they taste red blood cells or like metals, almost like copper metals in their mouth. Some people describe it as a tasting blood in their mouth. So in the SciTech Daily, 
from uh, the American Chemical Society, scientists create synthetic red blood cells that mimic natural ones, plus have new abilities. And the caption under the picture there is, artificial red blood cells, like the one shown here, could carry oxygen, therapeutic drugs and other cargo in the bloodstream. I can tell you. I just wanted to point that out to you, just because it is kind of on topic, but it's pretty off topic, I know that, but other cargo, artificial red blood cells. Anyway, let's leave that there. See you next time in the next video. Thanks for watching. Take care. Best wishes. Look after yourselves.